and boxing uh, ring historian and and writer, author Lou Eisen. This is Ring Talk. And today we're going to talk about the mob's influence in boxing. And I believe the photo that came up was uh, on the left, uh, Blinky Palermo, a vile scumbag, and Frankie Carbo, who, who was one of the charter members of Murder Incorporated, who killed dozens and dozens of men. What these two men had in common with only Madden, who was the first major mobster to run boxing on a national uh, scale to take it over, was that uh, they were psychopaths. They were entirely without empathy or morals. And as uh, Bud Schobig said to me on the set of Cinderella Man, they enjoyed putting a bullet in a man's head, just like another guy would sit there. He said, for Frankie, he said, like another guy would enjoy a good Cuban cigar while walking his dog. He also said for Frankie Carbo, killing to him, he said, mattered as much as he said, you know, when you're reading your morning paper and you're having eggs for breakfast and as you're eating and you spill a bit of eggs on the paper, you wipe it off, but you don't give a damn. He said, that's how Frankie felt about killing. Didn't care. Just go kill a person, two, three, four, and then turn around, say to the other mobsters, yeah, let's go for a coffee in a Danish and that was it. Didn't bother them. Didn't talk about it. It's just business. Now, with uh, mob control of boxing, it still goes on. And organized crime and boxing have been together for over 300 years. Uh, first fights that we believe were fixed happened in Britain in the mid to late 1700s. Uh, in my upcoming book, um, Blunders, Blood feuds and bad decisions, boxing's greatest controversies. Um, I have a fight that took place in 1780, I believe, between Peter Cochran and Billy Darts, and they were they were both paid. Uh, Billy Darts was paid extra to go down in the first round, and we can pretty well say he did that. Stuff like that was common, hard to prove, but my friend, boxing historian, the premier. A boxing historian in the world and bare knuckle boxing historian for Britain, Tony G, said to me that and showed that he had contemporary reports where Billy Darts was paid by gamblers to an extra hundred pounds, which was a lot in the 1780s, to go down. And there was no specific time, but he went down within a minute or two of the first round. And this wasn't a prize fight like you see today. This was way up on a stage and they didn't have gloves, and the other guy put him in a headlock and rammed his head into the turnbuckle, and you could do all sorts of things like that back then. And and he won, and it didn't come out till later on. And, of course, who benefited as always? The gamblers. The mobsters benefited, but the fighters didn't because uh, they got paid for their malfeasance, but no one wanted to, you know, book them again to fight. Uh, they did find a couple of fights, but, you know, for next to nothing. So. The way we know fixed fights today and mob control, of course, that started in 1921. Now, three things came together all at once to create this perfect storm to allow the mafia to move in and control boxing. Actually, four things. First of all, boxing had no central body, and it doesn't today. It'd be hard to take over the NBA or Major League Baseball or the NHL because to take them over, um, you, you, you need to have disparate groups. If you have one central body, it's hard to just control that one central body. Now, they did it in baseball. Arnold Rothstein fixed the 1919 World Series. And I was thinking about this last night. So he fixes the World Series. Now, you're thinking, how could a mobster go and say, okay, you guys, you know, you're the best. And the White Sox were the best baseball team, and this relates to boxing, by 30 games. 30 games. And... They had Shoeless Joe Jackson on the team, the great pitcher Eddie Sakati. So why would they throw the World Series? There's no reason to. You know, you're going to make extra money, except you weren't. They had a, a parsimonious, very stingy, cheap, thieving line owner in Charles Comiskey. So Comiskey forced them to pay for cleaning their own uniforms after games. They refused. They wore dirty, stinky uniforms until he said he would pay, and then eventually he took it out of their paychecks. So. Here's one of the main reasons why the White Sox, and this relates, this, I'll relate this to boxing in a minute, 
uh, through the World Series. Eddie Sicotti, their pitcher, was going to get a $10,000 bonus if he won 30 games. He won 29 games. And after he won 29 games, he had 15 more starts. This was the beginning of August. From the beginning of August and into September, Comiskey sat him down for all 15 starts. So at the end of the season, he goes into the office and Eddie Sicotti says, listen, I own, I, you should give me that money, but you didn't win 30 games. Right. I won 29, but I had 15 starts. I would have won at least one of them. And that would have given me the bonus, but you didn't win one of them because you didn't play them. Right. Because you didn't let me. And by treating his players like that, you know, he would say to a player, if you get 20 home runs, I'll give you a $10,000 bonus. And then he would change to two to a three on the contract. He could see that he did it. I said 30. Now I have the original contract. It's 20 here. You type this up. Right. Well, that was a mistake. It's now 30. So you don't get the money. And doing this to all the players who were the best players in the league in all of baseball, they had enough. So the gamblers knew this. And Arnold Rothstein went and said, listen, I'm going to give you 150, 200 grand to split between the nine of you. And you'll get 10, 15, 20 grand each. And you'll throw the World Series. And Cincinnati was a huge underdog. And that's how the mob makes their money. They'll bet on the underdog. And so, you know, before the first game, here's, here's, each guy's supposed to get 10 grand, you know, here's 70 grand. He takes the money and seven players get 10 grand. Shoeless Joe took the money and, and he gets, they all get the money, but there's still a couple more players plus bench players that didn't get the money. And so that was just the first payment. They're supposed to get more payments. Payments never came. And when the players complained, the mobsters said, that's it. That's all you're getting. Now shut up and throw the games. And the White Sox said, no, we're not going to do that. You you renege. Not realizing that Rothstein had Mayor Lansky, Lucky Luciano, Frank Costello, all these vicious killers on his payroll. So what, what the White Sox did was they win three games, two or three games in a row. The mobsters are like, well, we're going to lose all this money now. So they met with several of the pitchers, and they brought him into a room at gunpoint, sat him down, and said to Eddie Sicotti and the other pitchers, they said, hey, how you doing? Your wife, uh, Mary, very nice lady. In fact, I got some pictures. This is a picture of her at the store, a picture of her walking your lovely daughter Lucy to school. It's a picture of her with your son going to the corner store to get an ice cream. Here's a picture. In other words, you do what I say, or I can kill your whole family. And in the final couple of games, the mobsters had their muscles sit with the families to let the pitchers know and the players know you're going to do it our way. You're going to die. That's what happened in boxing. Or your family would die. This is what they did to guys. You're going to go down in this round. And that's the way it is. The mob never made idle threats. And the interesting thing about the mob, I was told by my friend Marvin Elkin, is they didn't know how to deal with people that were reluctant to do business with them or didn't want to go along with them. And Marvin said, it's like talking to your dog and your dog goes, huh? or trying to show your dog another dog in TV. Look, is a dog like you in TV and dog goes, what, what? And he said, that's what the way the mob was. They're like, what do you mean? No, no one ever says no. People get killed when they say no, because with the mob, they're not negotiating. They're not asking. They're saying this is what's going to happen, and you're going to do it this way. And if you don't, I'll, I'll, I'll kill you. And and so that's what happened. So the, th the, the thing, here's what happened to create the perfect storm. First of all, the United States Congress did the stupidest thing they've ever done. They, they instituted the Volstead Act. They passed the legislation for that, and then came prohibition. They tried to do something that you can't do, which is legislate morality. It's not possible. And, and that, the mobsters understood that because the mobsters had virtually no morals at all. So prohibition comes in, and now the mob is supplying, through bootlegging, liquor to every restaurant, every household, everywhere across the country. And Meyer Lansky said the mob then became the biggest employer of chartered accountants. And the reason for that is, they thought they would make one or two million, maybe, through prohibition. But now they're making hundreds of millions of dollars. That's what they're making.
and it's more money than they can possibly fathom, and they need to launder it. March 23rd, 1920, the Walker Law, Mayor James J. Walker, who was then a, a um, senator in state legislature in New York, sponsored a bill to, le to legalize boxing uh, on behalf of Al Smith, the governor, and Tammany Hall. And it worked. Got through. So now boxing's legal. No more newspaper decisions. Now you can have 15-round fights, or you can have 12-round fights, uh, and they create the New York State Athletic Commission. Everyone has to have a license. You're a bucket boy, you need a license. You're a manager, you're a boxer, you're a cup man, promoter. Everyone needs to be licensed. But most of the people working in it, being mobsters, didn't get a license. And a lot of people on the commission were paid off. And there was a rule, New York State law, saying if you're a felon, you can't get a license from the New York State Athletic Commission. But that, that rule, they only applied it uh, sparingly over the next 60, 70, 80 years, unless the media got on it, in which case they had no choice but to act. And sometimes even in that case, they didn't. So you have the Walker Law makes boxing legal. You have prohibition gives the mob the muscle. Now boxing's legal, so they don't have to worry about that. Now they got the, the money from prohibition and, and they have the muscle. And the other thing, of course, was the dempsey Carponche fight. Now, before, in 1921, before the dempsey Carponche fight, right up until Jess Willard, let's say, Guys, you know, Tommy Burns, when he fought Jack Johnson in 1908, got 30 grand. That was a lot of money back then. And he asked for that because, and he was right to do so because Johnson was the best heavyweight around. If I'm taking the biggest risk against the best guy, I deserve the most money. He didn't think anyone would ask or would pay him the 30 grand, but they did. So he loses to Johnson. The point about the 30 grand for the mob, that's small potatoes. To take a piece of that, it's going to cost them more in manpower to steal the money than the amount of the money they're actually stealing. It's not worth it to them. But then when Dempsey comes in and you start seeing these million dollar gates, now with Carponche, the gate was 1,789,000. But when you add in all the concessions and all the drinks sold and the publicity and all that, it's well over 2 million, almost 3 million. At that point, the mob's interested. That's the kind of money we like. We can use that. And so the problem at that point is you have the manager or the promoter, excuse me, Tex Rickard. He wants to put on this fight. And he's got to pay the fighters up front. Fighters aren't going to, still in Canadian boxing a lot of times, although they're supposed to pay up front, what they do here in Canada is we'll pay off the gate receipts, which is, that's just not professional. And it never works. You have to have the money up front. So Dempsey's the champion. He's going to get upwards of a million bucks, you know, eight, nine hundred grand. Carponchi's going to get a couple hundred grand, but they want it up front. Plus, they need the money for uh, uh, money for uh, extra money for training camps. And Rickard had a problem. He had so many ticket sales, he didn't have a stadium big enough. He had to build one. And who had the disposable income then to build? Well, the mob. Mobs making hundreds of millions of dollars off of prohibition. They had the money. So they lent money to, to Rickard. And then Mike Jacobs, who became a promoter, uh, succeeded, eventually succeeded Rickard, uh, was a big ticket scalper. And he also lent money. So they built the stadium. So now the mob is saying, listen, you know, we're giving you money for the stadium. And in return for that, we want. We want to control, uh, you know, we're going to have booze sales there. We're going to control the food concessions there. We want money back plus interest on the stadium built, and we want choice tickets. Rickard couldn't say no because without their money, the stadium doesn't get built. And he's dealt with people like this his whole life. And so they have the fight. The fight is successful. And then Dempsey doesn't fight again. You know, he fights a couple more times, excuse me. You know, he fights Tommy Gibbons and, and he fights Luis Firpo in 1923. And then he doesn't fight again until he fights Gene Tunney, where he loses the title. During that time period, only the killer Madden, who was originally from Britain of Irish descent, has moved to New York. 
He was belonged to a group, teenage gang called the Gophers. Their main rivals were the Hudson Dusters. He ended up killing all of them. And I guess he was about 14 when he committed his first murder, got away with it, committed another murder on a streetcar over a woman and killed a sales clerk who was in love with the same woman. No one on the streetcar was willing to testify against him. Was in a bar and um, actually a friend of his was in a bar and was joking with this other gangster who hated him, same gang, the Gophers, and said, hey, you know, your girl left you for Oni. And this other gangster didn't like it, killed Oni's friend. Oni got upset, had the guy go to another bar, had the girl that they had in between them that they both loved, soccer the guy in, he got killed, and Oni went to prison for it. Uh, before that, been trapped by a group of Hudson Dutzer, Dusters in a bar, and 11 of them against him, and they all shot him. And they thought he was dead, would be dead, but he got to the hospital in two or three minutes. They took up five or six of the bullets, 11 of the opposite gang. In two days, five of those gang members from the Hudson Dusters were dead, gone. Within two weeks, the other six were gone too. And this guy that had set Oni up, who, wanted, who, was, who was a member of Oni's own gang, but wanted to take it over, Oni ordered his killing and he got convicted of that and he goes to prison. And all prison ever did for guys like Oni Madden or Frankie Carbo was make them smarter, meaner, and more sophisticated criminals. Oni Madden came out of prison in 1923 and he, he learned in prison to be in the background. That's what you wanna do. You gotta be in the background, let the other guys do the work. Put layers of people in front of you to protect you so they can't trace it back to you. So who, who picked him up when he got out of Sing Sing prison in Austin, New York? Joe Gould, manager of Jimmy Braddock and several other fighters. Joe Gould, uh, in the movie I was in, Cinderella Man was played by Paul Giamatti. Gould was one of these front managers used by Oni Madden. Eddie Mead was another one. Eddie Mead uh, was the manager for Henry Armstrong and other guys. Uh, later on, he used uh, Luigi Sarecci and Walter Friedman and, and Broadway Bill Duffy to rip off Primo Carnera. So Oni Madden is now in control of boxing. When he gets out of prison, he works as a hired gun for Dutch Schultz for a short time, and then tells Dutch off and he starts his own successful completing operation. To give you an idea of the character of Oni Madden, when he got out of prison and Joe Gould picked him up, there was another man there named Arthur Beeler. And as they're driving away, Beeler said, hey, uh, Oni assigned your rackets when you were in prison uh, to three Irishmen, and he names the three Irishmen. Within three days, those three men were found dead in the East River. Oni was the toughest of all of them. And then he says, here's a beer. This is the Oni selling, and he drinks it, spits it at the guy, throws the bottle out, and he said, I'll be starting my own. And the other guy says, well, you can't do that. Oni doesn't like him, takes a gun out, bang! shoots the guy in the head. Oni is a complete psychopath and didn't brook opposition from anyone. Stop the car, dump the body, keep driving. Didn't care, didn't bother him, didn't give him a second thought. A friend of mine who knew him, I, I mean, I know a lot of people that met him when he was much older in the 60s, 1960s, when he was forced in 1935 because of parole violations to leave New York, move to Hot Springs, Arkansas, where his full-time nurse uh, at the end of his life was Bill Clinton's mom. Uh, they said this was a man completely without humanity. You know, he could see a dog get hit by a car or somebody threaten an old lady or a girl fall off a bike and hit her head. Didn't bother him, didn't change his day at all. So Oni's taking over boxing and he starts by controlling these various fighters, right? He's he's saying to this fighter and to their managers, you know, because he ran boxing in New York and he was smart. One of the things he did was he allied himself with um, uh, Charlie Lucky Luciano and and um, Arnold, the big brain, big brain Rothstein, um, Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, all these guys and all their 
organizations and muscle he had behind him. So basically, when you when you wanted to fight New York, you had to come visit Oni Madden. And he would tell you what it's going to be. And the only thing you could say is, yes, sir, thank you, sir. That was it. He would say, okay, this is what's going to happen. You're going to fight this guy, this guy, and this guy. You're going to win this fight and this fight and lose that fight. But win the next fight, um, I get 75% of everything you make. And to the manager, the same thing. I get 75% of everything you make from every fighter you manage. There's no argument. I mean, if you said, well, it's 75, I mean, I did all this work and I, you just take a gun out and shoot him. There was no argument. There was no discussion. And to take a gun out and shoot a guy, you only had to do it once. Then the word spreads to everyone that this is what the guy is like. You don't argue with him. He's a monster and he'll kill you. The Duke of the West Side. So only he's running this and he has a piece of all these different boxers. And there's a great story about Charlie Phil Rosenberg. Charlie Phil Rosenberg was fighting for the World Bantamweight title. He was trained by the immortal Ray Arcel, who, who helped train Angelo Dundee, my mentor. And when Charlie Phil was getting ready, Charlie Phil Rosenberg was getting ready to fight for the World Bantamweight title, uh, he had a problem, which was he, he, he loved women, wine, and food, and in that order. So it was hard to keep him focused on training. So Ray, and he was owned by Oni Madden. So Ray Arcel went to Oni and said, what am I going to do? The champion's already beaten him twice in non-title fights. I can't, you know, this is it's not worth letting the fight go forward if he's not going to make an effort. So Oni said, put him up on my apartment on Fifth Avenue, which they did. And I'll, I'll have my guys keep an eye on him. And Arcel stayed there. And then they also had Charlie Phil's mother come in and cook him nice Jewish meals. And in those days, you weighed in on the day of the fight. The fight was Saturday. But our cell was smart. So on Wednesday, they weigh him in, you know, after breakfast, and he's 125 pounds. He's seven pounds over the limit. And, uh, you know, Oni hasn't placed his bet yet, but he knows what he's going to do. And Charlie, from Wednesday to Saturday evening, he didn't eat. Didn't eat the rest of Wednesday, didn't eat Thursday, Friday, Saturday. He would take sips of water and then spit it out. And come Saturday, for the weigh-in Saturday morning, he's 118 pounds on the nose. But he looks terrible. He's extremely white, pallid, dehydrated. And, of course, after he goes home, his mother makes him a big breakfast, and he has a nice big lunch, and he has a nice dinner, and he can't stop drinking water. And Oni says, well, this guy's not going to make it. So Oni puts 50 grand on the champ to stop him within 10. And Charlie Phil goes in the ring and he wins every round, beats the pants off the champion easily. And so when the fight's over, Arcel, uh, you know, comes, they go back to the dressing room. Arcel says, hands him a bag. This is your shirt and pants. Get, get out of town. Get in a cab. Here's some money. Leave. Don't come back for a month or so. What? Just do it. Otherwise, if Oni sees you, you're as good as dead. Oni a bet against his own fighter because he didn't think, based on what he had seen, that he could win. And if he would have seen him that night, he probably would have killed him. So Charlie Phil had to go to, to Long Island or Staten Island for a long time, for a month or a month and a half before he could actually come back into New York, and it had blown over. Now, one of the other... Uh, interesting things about Oni the Killer Madden was he was the one who, who who did the blueprint. You know, he was the one who said, uh, we take the money from the managers. We take the money from both fighters' purses. Um, if the fighter, we're having problems with the fighter or the manager, we can kill them. Uh, if they're too well-known, we can just buy off the referee or the judges. That's what we can do. And, or we can pay off people and the New York State Athletic Commission uh, pay off the police. They could pay off anyone. That was his attitude. You could buy anyone off. Why not? So he said everyone had a price. So we go to fights like Dempsey. Dempsey has the first fight against Gene Tunney, and it's in Philadelphia in the rain. He loses his title. The fight was supposed to be in New York, but the New York State Athletic Commission, for some reason, grew a sense of morals and said you can't fight here 
Jack, unless you fight the black challenger, Harry Wills, who, who you have um, ducked. He was willing to fight Wills, and I think Dempsey would have killed him because Wills was 6'4", and Dempsey feasted on bigger guys. That was his specialty. He knew how to get under the reach, get inside, and just pound them to the body and bring it upstairs. But they said, if you don't fight Wills first, we won't let you fight Tunney. And they signed the agreement, Jack Doc Kearns, who was his manager, who also managed the great Archie Moore and, and Mickey Walker, the middleweight champ. Kearns knew how to work with the mob, get along with the mob, and, and still come out smelling like a rose, kind of. So uh, he signs the deal, but he won't fight Wills. And this was... You have to remember, this was 10 years after Jack Johnson had lost the title, and there was a lot of ill will over Jack Johnson, and they weren't going to give another black man a chance at the world heavyweight title that soon. So they want to fight with Tunney. Willard has, or Rickard has signed it. Tex Rickard has signed Gene Tunney to fight Jack Dempsey. They have no location. They can't fight in New York. And what are we going to do? So Ricker doesn't know what to do. He's not going to call talk to New York State Boxing Commission because they're not in charge. And he's he can't do anything about it. So he's still on the line for paying Dempsey a, a million dollars and paying Tony. He's agreed to that. Three, four hundred grand, five hundred grand. He, he can't back out of that. That's a signed contract. So it, what does he do? He calls Oni Madden. Oni says, OK, let me make a call. And he calls Boo Boo Hoff, Max Boo Boo Hoff in Philadelphia. Hoff says, let me call you back in 10 minutes. What are the dates that you can give me? And he gives them two or three dates. Hoff calls him back and says, I booked Sesqui Centennial Stadium in Philly on this date. That's when the fight will happen. And Madden says, great, thank you. They call, Will, uh, they call Rickard. Don't worry about it. We got a book for Philadelphia. The fight now moves to Philadelphia. That's where the fight's going to be. They're going to fight there. And, of course, as I said, Rickard needed help, right? He's got to advance the money to Dempsey. He's got to advance the money to Tunney. He's got to pay for training camps. And they said, well, let's take it out of Madison Square Garden funds. Well, I can't because I'm a promoter, but this fight's not being held at Madison Square Garden. You know, this has to come out of my pocket. And because he was a natural-born gambler, he didn't have all that money on him at one time. So he's got to go to Oni Man for the money and Boo Boo Hoff and Abner Longy Swillman, who was a mobster from New Jersey, around New Jersey. So they get the money and Hoff two times. First time he lends tiny money for his training camp. So the interesting thing here, of course, is when it comes to the actual fight, Hoff said, listen, all I did was get you a different venue. It was important. I'm not going to demand 80%. Just give me five points off the gross receipts that's fine you know and this was over a two million dollar gate so he gets his money he's happy with that uh, only madden gets his chunk from from jack doc kearns he gets it from billy gibson who was tiny's manager gibson also trained the great benny leonard and and uh abner longies wilman gets a piece and the fight goes in philadelphia and of course dempsey hasn't fought in three years and He's trained, but he's not really in fight shape, and he loses in the rain, and he really loses. He knows he's lost. And, you know, a lot of people bet on Dempsey, but people like Oni Manit and other gangsters always had spies, excuse me, in the training camps. And these spies in the training camps are giving him daily updates, saying, yeah, Dempsey's physically in shape. He's not fat. Yes, he's sparring in this, but his timing is way off. He's rusty. He tires quickly. You know, Tunney's been fighting nonstop the last three years. You got to put your money on Tunney. And they did. And they won a fortune. Now they have a rematch. They want a rematch. But how are you going to have a rematch? You can't really have a rematch because he beat him so decisively. Tunney won every round. And Dempsey admitted that. So they have to have a tune up fight. Tune up fight is against Jack Sharkey, the number one fighter, number one ranked fighter in the world next to Tunney. And so Dempsey agrees to fight him. And Sharkey's manager was Jack Buckley. And Buckley was a mobster. This was a mob guy. And in the first six, seven rounds, Sharky's pounding Dempsey. And Dempsey thought Dempsey thought the fight may have been fixed because he said he had me 
groggy and out several times. And then he just moved back and didn't continue punching me. I don't know why. Maybe he was told to. So in the seventh round, Dempsey hit him low. And Sharky did the thing you're not supposed to do. He stopped. He said, one, he just put his hand out like Dempsey and he turned to the ref. And he says, hey, the guy just hit me low. And as he says that, Dempsey hits him in the jaw with the right, or left hook, knocks him out. So now he's grabbing his groin, he's grabbing his jaw, and he's counted out. And the referee after said, hey, I didn't make a mistake. I didn't tell him to stop fighting and lower his hands. And he's right. Now everything's in place. Dempsey gets this shot at Gene Tunney. The fight's going to be in Chicago. Al Capone, who loves Dempsey, comes to meet with him and says, listen, I can fix the referee and the judges. So you win the title back. And Dempsey said, I appreciate the offer, but I I think now after the Sharky fight and the first Tunney fight, I know how to fight Tunney now. And because of the two fights, I'm really in shape. And so I think I can do this on my own. You know, still bet on me, but I can do this on my own. And Capone says, I won't interfere. But of course, with Capone, what he says and wasn't and what he does, he only cares about himself. So Capone did interfere. Capone had his own referee that he wanted in there, I believe Dave Miller, and to ensure that Dempsey would win. And Boo Boo Hoff wanted his own referee, Dave Barry. Why did he want Dave Barry, who ended up refereeing the fight? Barry was into him for a lot of money from gambling debts. Also, for this fight, and it went into the newspapers, Hoff had lent Tiny and Billy Gibson almost 250 grand to run their training camp, pay for everything, pay for expenses, because they were in debt. Even though they got paid a lot for the first MC fight, they still had a lot of bills and a lot of expenses. So he loaned them the money. He had them sign a contract. Very unusual. Mobsters don't do that. They only deal in cash, can't trace cash. So that's why, you know, they have the fight. Now Dave Barry's the ref. But to get Dave Barry to ref and to get to have Capone agree to let this other ref come in, they had to pay off Capone. And so, you know, Boo Hoff, Abner's Willman, uh, Oni Madden, and others had to say to Capone, what's your price to get your referee out and get ours in? And he said half a mil. And so they give him 500 grand. Capone's happy. He didn't have to kill anyone, didn't have to do any work. He just said, sure, change the referee, I'll take half a million. And that's what he did. And so during the fight, it's going the same way the same fight went. Tunney's winning. Dempsey is getting beat. But in the seventh round, he manages to drop Gene Tunney. And Tunney was out. But Dempsey wouldn't go to the neutral corner. It's a battle of the long counts. Famous fight. And people said this was the first fight where the neutral corner rule was in. That's not true. It came in four years earlier uh, after the Louis St. Joe Furpo fight to make boxing more palatable to the sporting public because you could stand over a guy and pound him as he's trying to get up. And so the referee keeps pointing, you know, and says, Jack, you got to go to the farthest neutral corner. And he won't. And finally he does. At that point, the rules for, for boxing, professional boxing, everywhere and in the state of Illinois state that once the fighter is in the neutral corner, the referee picks up the count from the timekeeper. Timekeeper was at the count of nine. So Dave Barry should have looked at him and said, okay, you know, nine, 10. He didn't, he started one, two. By the time he gets to two, the timekeeper said, out, fight is over, he's out. He's still counting, three, four, five, six, and Tony gets up. And then he manages to make it out of the round by, by running. He's already been knocked out, but they're not counting it. Next round, he drops Dempsey, and Dempsey literally is like they're touching each other. He's standing right over him. Dave Barry jumps in. One, two, and Dempsey gets up immediately. But he never looked at Tony and said, stop, go to the farthest neutral corner. And Roger Kahn saying this is proof that he was mobbed up. It is partially, but the other proof is the fact that his name was linked to Bubohoff, and he owed, and he worked for Bubohoff, and he, he owed him a lot of money. He worked regularly with gangsters. Now, boxers and managers 
that were associated with the mob didn't do so out of their own uh, volition. They had no choice. They didn't want to end up broke and, and indigent with brain damage, urine in the blood, no money, homeless. That was just the way that it went with these guys. So, and this is a long story. It's going to take quite a few episodes to do. Um, there were two other main fighters then at that time that figured significantly into the Oni Madden story and the meshing of the mob and boxing. The one is Jimmy McClarnon. McClarnon is one of the all time great fighters. He beat 13 world champions and 14 Hall of Famers from Canada. He was the two time undisputed world welterweight champion. And his manager was Pop Foster, great manager. And Foster grew up literally across the street from Oni Madden in England, in Leeds. So when they come to New York, you know, Fa uh, McLaren and Foster are doing great in the West Coast. They come to New York to fight there. And they pay a visit to Oni Madden. Madden's happy to see Foster. And Madden says, listen, Pops. And he says, Jimmy, no one's going to touch you. No one's going to bother you. You're not going to get hurt. No one's going to take any money. You don't have to pay any tribute to me or anyone. Your fights are on the level. All of them. And that's what he said. Now, if that's true, and many people think it was true, then Jimmy McLaren is the only fighter in boxing history to ever be given that accommodation by a mobster. It never happened before never happened again but only did make them pay in another way which i'll get to in a second so pop foster had two rules for for mclaren when he fought had to be the heaviest guy had to get paid the most why asses in the seats mclaren yeah. always made the most money so mclaren is doing well in boxing he's going out during the day in new york with only madden they become good friends no one messes with him so they're getting re ready to fight i think it was his first fight in New York, or it may have been the fight with Sid Terrace, uh, where he knocks him out in one round. And Foster's taping his hands. And two, they figured it had to be out of town gangsters because ga gangsters in town would have known that only man that runs boxing in New York. You don't mess with him. So they come in and they pull their guns on Pop Foster. But Foster had been around since the 1870s and 80s in boxing. He'd been around since the time of Tommy Ryan, the great middleweight champ. And back then, that was a compliment. You know, back then, just saying this guy was as good as Tommy Ryan was like saying today, this guy was as good as Muhammad Ali or Joe Lewis. So these guys pulled guns on him and they said, we're taking your fighter. He belongs to us. And he said, I'm not the manager, which was a lie. I'm the trainer. That's all I do. And he said, who's the manager? I don't know, but this is his number. Well, he gives him the direct line to Oni Madden. Can you imagine how stupid these guys are? They call up Oni Madden. Listen, you, and they could hear his English accent. You lie me, SOB. I'm going to tell you something. We're taking over your fighter, and we're going to take his money, and he's going to do what we say. And if you don't agree, we're going to come kill you. All Oni Madden says is, sure. Uh, you're where are you now? We're in the dressing room. Okay, I'll be there in uh, ten minutes. Sign the papers over. Okay, great. And these guys think, well, that was easy enough. And then, of course, ten minutes later, door burst open. Only Madden walks in with ten guys, and the guys got their guns. Still have their guns out, and they turn to look at Oni. And Oni said, "I hate to disappoint you." You're not even the first person or second or third person to point a gun at me today. Who do you think you're dealing with? Who the hell do you think you are? Do you know who I am? And these guys turn into Jackie Gleason, ha, 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 because I've seen his photo in the newspaper. You know, I'm only Madden. I am boxing. And they didn't call him only the killer Madden for nothing. Now, the story goes that these two guys were not only never found again, they were never even seen leaving McLaren's dressing room. Which means Madden's guys just not only killed them, but dismembered them and did whatever they did with them. They were never seen again. Only Madden didn't take that from anyone. 
didn't take it from Dutch Schultz. Even the Italian gangsters were afraid of Oni Madden and they backed off. The way Oni Madden subtracted or not subtracted, exacted tribute from Jimmy McClarner once, McClarner was fighting Barney Ross and he lost the first fight, which he genuinely lost. He hadn't fought in a year. And McClarner had the, the fighter's main bane, which was bad hands. And they have the second fight, McLaren wins. And McLaren made uh, um, a strategic mistake. Before the third fight, this is taking place during the Great Depression. Everyone is broke. These fights are giving hope to everyone. But they're making tons of money. First fight, there was like 65, 70,000 people. Second fight, been rained out for three days and still 35, 40,000 people showed up. So we get the third fight. And, you know, they're going to grow 60, 70,000 people. The gate's going to be in the hundreds of thousands. McLaren's the golden goose. And McLaren made the mistake of saying, I've been at this a long time. Uh, if I win this fight, I'm done. And it was a close fight. I've watched a fight many times. And for years, I thought, well, McLaren won. But now that I've watched it recently, I don't think McLaren won. I think Ross beat him. That's not the point. The point is, Oni Madden did not want to lose his golden goose. So McClarner loses and Madden says, don't worry about it. Don't you worry about it. We'll give you a fourth fight and you'll get even more money. And meanwhile, Mc, uh, Madden's taking his money off the gross gate. So he's still making a lot of money and off the fight and off the ancillary profits, even without ripping off. Uh, Jimmy McLaren or Barney Ross. Barney Ross was connected because he had done work for Al Capone after his father had been murdered. And Capone just said, this isn't your line of work, Barney. You should be doing something else. This isn't for a nice boy like you. So he had a lot of mob connections. They all did. You couldn't avoid it if you were in boxing at the time. So uh, McLaren fights two or three more times. And Madden says, okay, we'll get a fourth fight. And McLaren quits. He said, nope, don't need it. He said, you only fight for two reasons, glory or money. Never cared about the glory, don't need the money. He was already a millionaire several times over, and he held on to it. And he, he didn't fight again. He, three fights after the third Ross fight, that was it. He was done. What's he going to do? What's Madden going to do? He can't let his cash cow walk out the door. Well, lucky for him. In comes Primo Carnera, the saddest case in all of boxing history. There's a real big uh, misconception where people say, you know, Carnera was fine until he got to the States and they ripped all those gangsters, screwed him over. He was screwed over long before he got to the States. French gangsters took control of him. Uh, uh, Paul Journey, Leon C. And they, you know, they signed, he signed away 35% of himself to these guys in perpetuity. So he, he was illiterate. He didn't know what he was doing. So they bring him to the States and he's met by Oni Madden who signs Walter, good time Charlie Friedman to look after him, Big Bill Duffy, Louis Serecci. And they basically steal all of his money. All of McLaren, or McLaren, all of Primo Carnera's money. And they paid fighters off. Every fighter is paid off to lose. Occasionally, they allow a fight to be on the level. A fight would be on the level. And if it was, Carnero would lose. And Carnero ended up with nothing. I mean, he was, you know, you see the movie The Harder They Fall with uh, Humphrey Bogart. Bogart's not playing Jimmy Cannon, who they thought he was playing. He's playing the publicist, Harold Conrad. And Rod Steiger's character, Nick Banko, is supposed to be um, Frankie Carbo. Of course, the problem with that is, is that Carnero wasn't part of Carbo's era. Carbo came in in the early 30s. Carnero belonged lock, stock, and barrel to Oni Madden. And Carnero has all these fights. Oni Madden's just stealing everything, stealing his entire purse. He stole so much money. He, he signed, he forced Carnero to sign the other 65% over to him. And then he sold pieces of Carnero to his gangster friends. And Carnero owned, uh, Carnero ended up selling over 100% of himself. So 
you literally had a situation where he was fighting, getting 300 grand for a fight. And even though he was getting 300 grand, he comes out owing 500 grand because he's owed because he signed so much of himself away. There were times where he had to stop fighting for the year because if he kept fighting, he'd go more in debt, even though he was supposed to be making money with each fight. And he wasn't. They just took all the money. And this happened quite often. Ike Williams told me at the Hall of Fame one time, he signed for a TV fight to defend the lightweight title, and he was getting 80 grand, and he got a check for two grand. And when he complained to Blinky Palermo, Palermo put a gun in his mouth and said, take the bullet or take the check. And so he took the check. Arthur King, the great Arthur King, who was the best lightweight in the world at one time, including Ike Williams, was signed by the mob at gunpoint off of Davey Yak from Toronto, the great manager, who was himself a tough guy. And Arthur King, when I spoke to him about what the mob had done to him, he said, I can't talk about it or think about it, because if I did, I'd go down to the States again, get a gun and kill them all. So this is the effect these people had on each other. So Carnera beats Jack Sharkey. Sharkey had already beaten him easily before, and, and he was told by the mob, go easy on him. So he beat him up, but he went easy on him. He didn't knock him out. So they have a rematch when Sharkey's a champ. And Sharky gets knocked out, but he doesn't get knocked out. If you watch the tape, Carnera misses him with the right hand and then just shoves him like this with his forearm. And Sharky goes whatever and dramatically falls to the canvas and he can't get up. And he denied forever. He denied forever that it was a fixed fight. No, it was a legit punch. But, you know, three, four months before he died, he figured I, I'm terminal. It doesn't matter now. And all those guys are dead. He said, yeah, they came to me, put a gun to my head and said, my guy wins in the seventh round and or eighth round. And, you know, that was it. And that's what happened. That's how Carnera got the title. Carnera got the title because Sharky took a dive. Now, the outlier here is Max Bear. He has to defend against Max Bear. And people said, well, why was Max Bear indemnified? How did Max Bear... How was he allowed to fight Sharky or excuse me, Carnera head up? Because he would he was so much better than Carnera. Because the mob also had a piece of bear. There was nothing bear could do about it. If you wanted to fight for the title, the heavyweight title was owned by Oni Madden. Oni Madden said, That's it. That's the way it goes. And and you can win, but we want this much of you. And he made a deal with Ansel Hoffman. And so Bear goes and he destroys him. And Carnera was just used as a punching bag for the rest of his career for fighters on the way up. He went into wrestling and Madden took money off of him. And in fact, Max Bear helped him get into wrestling. And, and you know, they hounded him until the day he died. Only Madden uh, had to go back for pro violations in 1932 to Sing Sing. And he came out a year later in 33, but by 35, the FBI and state police were hassling him every day. They were arresting him two, three, four times a day. What's he going to do? I mean, everyone he deals with in boxing is a felon. So he, he can't take it anymore. So what he does is he moves to Hot Springs, Arkansas, which he visited, becomes the godfather of Arkansas. He still controls boxing. He still holds on to it. But he seeds the day-to-day -day operation of it to to Frankie Carbo and also to uh, Carbo's assistant, uh, the numbers runner and vicious killer from Philadelphia, uh, Frank Blinky Palermo. And Carbo, Carbo uh, was just an incredibly vicious man. And he, you know, uh, my friend told me that uh, Oni Madden was more vicious, hard to believe. One story about Oni Madden, which I neglected to tell was, um, Joe Goldman is Jimmy Braddock, and Braddock, when he fought Abe Feldman, broke his hand. And so the fight was stopped. Both fighters were disqualified for not putting on a fight. Braddock tried to, but his hand was broken, his right hand, and he's an Orthodox fighter. In the movie Cinderella Man th that I was in, they show him being suspended by Jimmy Johnson from boxing. But Jimmy Johnson didn't have the power to suspend him. Only the New York State Athletic Commission did, and they didn't suspend him. What happened was Johnson just wouldn't book him into Madison Square Garden for a while. But that didn't matter to Braddock because he needed six to eight months to get his hand healed. And he did. And then Joe Gould approached um, Jimmy the Boy Bandit Johnson and said, listen, I want to book him back in. He said, nah, the last time he stunk to join him. Yeah, but he had a broken hand and he still kept fighting. Now his hand's healed and he wants to fight. You can use him. 
to make other guys look good. No, nope. I'm the boss. I say no. But we always book Jimmy. No, get out. Well, that was a stupid move because Gould was the assistant to Oni Madden. Oni Madden went and spoke with Joe Gould. Gould came to him and he told him what happened. He goes, let me get this straight. Jimmy Johnson said he's the boss. Yes. And that Jim Braddock will never fight Madison Square Garden again. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And he just turns to his assistants and said, get him. You know, bring him here. And they, you know, they go into his office, in Madison Square Garden. I just got a couple of phone calls. And these mobsters just rip the phones out of the wall, pick him up on the armpit to come in with us. And then they get in, they said, put him on the table. And then literally on his desk, you know, undress him. They rip his shirt off and they rip his, like his jacket and shirt. They strip him naked. And, you know, uh, what's this, uh, Madden takes out a machete and says, I want you to tell me why I shouldn't carve your heart out right now. And of course, you know, they thought, Joe Gould later said he thought Jimmy Johnson was having a heart attack. He was screaming, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? What did I do? What do I do? I'll do whatever, whatever you say. What I, who the hell are you to say that you're the boss? I'm not the boss. Right. Who runs boxing? You do. I am boxing. I control boxing. Everything here in New York and across this country in boxing happens because of me. And it happens when I say it happens and it happens the way I say it happens. He said, right now it's 7 p.m. In the next 30 minutes, you're going to go out. You're going to make a match between Jimmy Braddock and another fighter. I don't care who it is. And you're going to announce it within the hour. And it's going to come out in the late newspapers. If not, go home and kiss your wife goodbye. And he gets up off the desk. They throw him his clothes. He goes, and, you know, half hour later, it's a press release from Madison Square Garden. Jimmy Braddock's making a comeback. He's fighting Corn Griffin. And, and he won the fight. And it's in the late papers. And eventually, um, Madden, even though he left, he'd had enough of Jimmy Johnson. You know, he said, why am I dealing with this idiot? You know, I'm the boss. Why are you arguing with me? And, and why, why are you giving me flack? Why are you saying this is a better fight or that's a better fight? I don't care about your opinion. Your opinion means nothing to me. You're nothing but a two-bit thief. So you're done. You're gone. You're fired. Get out. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm the promoter. Everyone, I, I said get out. And he's removed. And the person who moves in is Mike Jacobs. And they admire Mike Jacobs' pluck because Jacobs said to Madden or to Jimmy Johnson, Johnson wasn't going to let Joe Lewis fight there. Madison Square Garden because he was black and he wanted black, he wanted John, uh, Lewis to lose on purpose because he was black. Lewis's managers were also criminals: Julian Black, John Roxborough. They were numbers runners and gamblers, but they knew how the game was played and they hooked up with Jacobs. Jacobs didn't care about a person's skin color; he wanted to rip everyone off. So he said, "I got you. You have Madison Square Garden, but I got Joe Lewis." And so he ended up selling out Yankee Stadium, the Polo Grounds, and only man and saying, "Well, this is great." We had a fight card in Madison Square Garden last night. 1,300 people showed up. It can hold 20,000. Joe Lewis fought in, in polo grounds, and 80,000 people showed up. So he just said, that's why he just said to Jimmy Johnson, you're done. And puts Jacobs in, issues the new era in boxing. That's when Oni Madden, because of all the flack coming down upon him, has to leave and goes to Arkansas, where he receives a monthly check. Every day until I think July 1st, 1965, the day he died, uh, for all his rackets. He received the monthly check from New York, uh, uh, courtesy of Frank Costello, because he didn't he, he knew Carbo and he knew uh, Palermo, got along with him, didn't trust him. Carbo was a specialist for Murder Inc. He was one of the few that was on retainer. He did the hard killings. He also killed Bugsy Siegel. And as Madden fades from public view, but still has some power. Carbo and Blinky Palermo and all their underlings, all these terrible people, Jaime the Mink, Wallman, Champ, Siegel, all these vicious, evil, vile people 
rise up from the muck and the primordial ooze to take what Oni Madden started and to rip fighters off to such an extent that we'd never seen before. Where what Carvel did was I'm taking the, both fighters purses, I'm taking the promoter's purse, I'm taking the gate receipts, I'm taking the TV money, and I'm betting on the fights because they're fixed. So he just went and stole everything. And it was only, which we'll get to next week, at the end, at the very end in the early 60s, where he got caught on tape and was sent away for it. Although he still controlled it while he was in prison. That's just a opening beginner's course on the history of the mob and boxing. If you want more, go to my Substack, lueisen.substack.com, uh, Once Upon a Time in the Prize Ring. My first two installments are up of the mob and boxing, or boxing and the mob. And uh, I have a third installment coming up soon. Uh, it's worth checking out. You can get a monthly or weekly, uh, or excuse me, a monthly or a yearly subscription and uh, worth getting. Uh, lots of great articles there as well as those. My name's Lou Eisen. Thanks for watching Ring Talk. See you again next week.